takes two humans to make one, four to make two, eight to make four, and so on. Every hundred years, we average four generations. If we look back to the year 1500, we see a genetic net totaling a million ancestors. Our relatives since the year 1100 would exceed the world's present population. Life is a composite of reflections. Every life reverberates throughout a net of infinite relativity. Critical to the survival of our species is the biological drive to extend our individual genetic lineage. In so doing, we construct communication networks to solidify human connection and to comprehend our environment. We react to the content of communication media, but are less aware of the consequences caused by their form. A hundred thousand years ago, a mutation happened in, uh, in human beings. Uh, something happened in our head that, that caused us to change our thinking. My hunch is that that had something to do with the concept of paired opposites, of up, down, black, white, life, death, uh, X's, crosses and squares appear in the petroglyphs and on cave walls at this time. Also at this time, weaving appears, uh, the in, the out, the warp and weft of the loom was used to make clothing, shelter, nets. It's no coincidence that scientists and mathematicians later turn to the loom for the binary logic of the digital computer. Uh, this idea of the woven connection is fundamental in our thinking. Primitive humans evolved languages to benefit their collective survival. Eventually, they expressed themselves in visual symbols or glyphs. Egypt is a wonderful opportunity for us because we can study uh, the dawn of literacy in that wonderful civilization. We can see the impact of the ability to read and write on that society. It's enormous. Um, their reaction is extremely impressive. Um, Egypt was so moved by the ability to write down the word and to read it back later uh, that they created a god. They conceived of a god to protect this magnificent capability. His name was, was Thoth. Um, he's the ibis-headed god with the long black curved beak. Uh, he takes notes when your heart is weighed on your day of judgment. Having written it, it's forever. Beautiful way to communicate that when you write something down, if that document can be saved, it is relatively timeless. As societies evolved literacy, an elite emerged, which consolidated power with private writings, then holy books that only they were able to read. Non-literates who could only hear the readings remained fixed in their social class. The medieval situation, I think spirituality is expressed in a very interesting fashion. We could use Chart Cathedral as uh, our key example. It usually is the classic illustration of the following point. Um, let me quote from others that uh, the medieval cathedral uh, is the Bible in stone. It's meant to be read. It is meant to be interpreted. It is meant to uh, 
also amuse and entertain. Of course, it is meant to instruct. Let's take a simple uh, window from Chartres, the Passion window, for example. Um, the Passion window, like all medieval stained glass windows, is meant to be read from the bottom to the top in a left-right fashion. And it simply tells a story frame by still frame. Now that's just the stained glass windows. If we turn to sculpture, uh, there are uh, hundreds and hundreds of carved figures at Chartres Cathedral. Uh, I'm using this illustration to suggest to you that there is a lot of uh, subject matter, a dense amount of symbolism. Um, we need a guide lecturer. Uh, to lead us through that. The people of the time, however, were much more familiar with those characters and those stories, uh, paid a much more attention to what the literate class told them about what was in the Bible and heard that uh, at least once of every week of their lives. Um, being enabled, unable to read, of course, um, they had to have it uh, in illustrated picture story and uh, thank goodness they did it's left us a wonderful monument literacy was empowerment both as a means of information as well as a method by which power was kept exclusive the process of reading encourages isolation from this privacy changed from being antisocial to being valued thus Reading stimulated concepts of individual rather than collective identity, the key to democratic societies. The character of the community changed from a local, oral tradition of networking to that of a more diversified networking. Privacy is crucial to the introspection required for creative and spiritual growth. The mind of the individual could now remain open, exploring and relating previously unknown thoughts by maintaining a state of reflection. When I was in high school in 1958, I went to the branch library and asked for Orwell's 1984 I saw, I saw the card for it in the card catalog, but it wasn't on the shelf. So I went to the circulation desk and was told that indeed the book uh, was there, but it was being kept behind the circulant, circulation desk on a special uh, shelf where other books like it were kept. And these books, as it turned out, were books that uh, were politically inappropriate, at least to a certain age group, I guess. And it wasn't until I showed the librarian my reading list from my high school teacher that uh, she still reluctantly and tisk tisking pulled it out from the back and uh, handed it to me and allowed me to check it out. And uh, I noticed that inside the front cover was a black star that had been stamped onto it. There actually were books that were deemed to be inappropriate and in a sense banned um, and this set off in me a, a real interest in of course reading the book I, I read that right away um, and it made me realize that there were things in in books that were dead serious they weren't simply experiences that you in a way had to have because they were assigned and so you read them and perhaps enjoyed them perhaps not, but there was finally for me a, a reality um, about the, the reading experience that I had never had before. Exploration of inner and outer perceived space has reshaped religion, science, medicine, social organizations, human migration, and the arts. Each extension of our understanding sends a powerful wave through our civilizations. Five hundred years ago, a transition was formed from seeing information to the silent hearing of information when the artistic use of printing graphic images led Gutenberg to invent the movable type necessary for book publishing. 
Gutenberg invented the printing press in order to distribute a single translation of the Bible to a larger audience. The consequence of this, ironically, was not a unified religious point of view, but a number of different interpretations, causing the formation of new religious factions. The growth of publishing was due to mass printing. This popularization was facilitated by using common language and subject matter. This was at the center of the Renaissance's humanist movement. Literacy, with the advent of publishing, assisted the intellectual growth of the world's population, as well as global exploration and colonization. Once there were a few books read over and over by a privileged few. Now there are numerous books privately selected and read once by numerous people. Books in their very material self is an art form. My father was a bookbinder, and he covered books in leather, and then he did the gold uh, overlay on some of the embossing. So I suspect, courtesy of my father, I learned the sheer lush pleasure of the sight of a book and the feel, especially the leather-bound book, in, uh, in the hand and then the magic of paper from the very, very thinnest of paper to the very heavy stock. I am bothered by a book of cheap stock that gets brown around the edges very quickly and sort of oxidizes away on you. Uh, it shouldn't be that way. A book should be a pleasure to hold, a pleasure to read, a pleasure to simply pass and to notice in passing on the bookshelf. Yes, a wonderful art form. The invention of the kind of book that we use today, the codex uh, book structure, a magnificent achievement. The subject and the form of the book with a linear beginning, development, conflict, and resolution reflected a human life. The books themselves became metaphoric humans with a portable mind and body. I think of uh, those challenges of classical literature, the Iliad and Odyssey, those were intense. Uh, you could, uh, you had to learn how to sort of peel back all the layers of meaning, the sound, the sense, the evocative power of images, the sense of drama and conflict. I mean, it truly engaged all of my imaginative uh, faculties. Uh, in the process of reading, or things like Shakespeare plays, you know. I find those very intense experiences because they happen on so many levels of meaning. The beauty of the language, the universality of the characters, you know, the kind of, um, the same kinds of uh, plots and problems and conflicts that we all experience and trying to, you know, make all of those accessible to you through a language that we don't speak anymore. I mean, that's a challenge. Those have taken a lot of time to get at and uh, they have yielded great rewards. Reading all my life has taken me away from the world. I, um, I don't hear people when they speak to me when I read. Um, I'm unaware of my surroundings. This has been a constant frustration in my family since I learned to read. Uh, that I simply drop out, I'm away, I'm a long way away, and I'm in a world um, that is even devoid of the author. I don't know what happens, but it's a world of my thoughts. It's intense, it's very real. It can be uh, extraordinarily profound, it can move me to tears, I will laugh out loud, um, I will have nightmares over it. Um, it can be a stunning experience. It can be an enraging experience, so you take a book and throw it against the wall, it makes you so angry. It can be a delightful experience, but it is um, inevitably um, something that builds a reservoir within you of images, of words, of descriptions, of intense feelings that you've had, uh, intense emotions of, um, of anger, of fear, of sexual arousal, you name it and somehow it's all within me. It's still there. Read it once and you've put it somewhere, maybe in your soul. Literacy brings with it the power of information, the power to accelerate technology, the power to convey history, and the power to determine collective thought. The written word 
overpowered the spoken word in credibility and, in so doing, displaced older patterns of communication. Non-literate societies, for instance, use music and dance as ritual expressions, enactments of myths, religious pageants, artistic forms crucial to unifying the community. The human voice itself was valued for its rich variety, whereas literate voices tend to form more monotonous rhythms, tend to resemble the repetition of print. Socrates expressed the concern that written thought diminished the mental capacity for debate and, therefore, the expansion of consciousness. He himself did most of his creative work through dialogue, the act of conversational investigation and verbal persuasion. Well, when I think of tribal visual language, uh, I'm not a person that's been raised in a tribe, okay? So my access to a tribal visual language, I'm going to draw on uh, my teaching and knowledge of the Native American culture, perhaps particularly the Navajo. And uh, I believe that the visual language there is much more a part of the experience that you have of things. I'm thinking of, for instance, experiences of masks, that would be worn for ceremonies, of dancing, of the movement that goes with dancing, and of course of the sound that accompanies that movement. And um, I use an experience in my comparative religion classes involving a unity dance from the native peoples to give people an experience of the visuals and the being with that concept of unity. Uh, so I think it's much more immediate and it's more integrated. You know, the individual is drawn into and becomes a part of that visual language and that sound and that movement. I think with something that is literary, there's more of a distancing of the individual from what it is that you're reading and therefore there's more control of that and I think it tends to develop much more self-consciousness and whereas it can be capable of having all the colors and the sounds that we find in visual communication they would be nuanced differently. We can never anticipate or predict the impact new media will make either on old media or on our life. New media tends to be used initially as an extension of old media. For example, photography first mimicked painting and cinema first recorded theatrical productions. Film became an art with a revolutionary expression when artists explored its unique potential, not theater's history. Then, the possibilities of cinema were liberated. I think that when you compare film and the written word, uh, John Huston told, asked Ernest Hemingway for what Hemingway thought was his worst novel, and Huston said he would make it into a good film. So Hemingway said, to have and to have not, and Huston made it into a great film. I don't think you can compare film and uh, literature because of language, what language can do in the, on the page, a film can't do. And what the image can do in a film, the page can't do. So I don't think it's fair to compare them or to try to adapt them. There has, they have to be revisioned in the sense if you're going to, a film has to revision a novel, if I can coin a term, yeah. Reading requires visual scanning, which is a systematic visual exploration. The mass printing and reading of books directly stimulated the rapid evolution of the visual arts. Seeing tends to overwhelm words. The, the print media is a materialistic one. By that I mean it's a physical presence, the ink on the paper, the pages bound together. It's something you hold in your hand. The, 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 the binding of the book is something you often caress. I mean, we have this phrase, you curl up with a good book. The, the electronic media happens on the other side of a glass screen. It's something that comes to you in an ephemeral kind of way. It's there for a while and then it's gone. It's not something that you can study. Uh, something that you can fall asleep on. Seeing without probing beneath the visible is only spectating. 
When we classify or merely label an idea, we end speculation and encourage passive acceptance. Seeing a work of art, for instance, whether it is a painting, a sculpture, a photograph, or architecture, is searching beyond a representation of its subject or the surface function of its form. It may also serve as a record of a culture's entire social and sacred beliefs based on the intent of the creator of that work. For example, an immediate contrast may be found in comparing the architecture of a non-literate society with that of a literate society. Their forms are dictated by the necessity of what messages need to be conveyed to the people living in that time. Chartres Cathedral can certainly function as an illustration of a fundamentally illiterate society um, using art as a didactic instrument. Um, we could bounce off of that and turn it around and look at the 20th century and particularly the, the movement in architecture called uh, the international style. The stunning thing about that style is its absolute absence of surface decoration, uh, a kind of less is more severity. Uh, it can be quite beautiful in the hands of a master like Mies van der Rohe because it becomes a jewel box of simplicity. There is nothing said to us in the international style. It teaches us nothing. Uh, it lends us no dreams, no images. Uh, it does not reside in our consciousness. It is not a cultural artifact in any sense like Chart Cathedral. If Chart Cathedral is the Bible in stone, then an Egyptian temple is the whole world of the gods and goddesses, the spiritual universe in stone. It's all that we revere, all that we love, all that we adore as human beings on every square inch of the house of God. Art history consists of the graphic immortalizing of animals, divine incarnations, heroes, ancestors, family, and finally, the self, the arts, which were initiated by ritual, now drift into self-referential entertainment. Corporate financed and designed, they are not being generated out of a unique and private experience, but out of a formula that is only calculated to find a larger audience, rather than communicate personal understanding, as well as a deeper understanding of common humanity. Mass media, which sells fractions of time, sound bites, have a vested interest in implying that there is no depth. Their reality consists of endlessly shifting oil slicks of information. The current barrage of visual information results in gulping unchewable pieces. The more sensory involving the media, the more it discourages introspection and therefore growth. When I think of the electronic media, uh, I think of a media that of media that um, really absorb the attention of the viewer. Uh, we're typically, I think, with maybe a few exceptions, uh, but typically, and even in films, we're drawn into the events that are happening. That seems to be the intention. Uh, to the extent that we no longer have that uh, critical or aesthetic distance that allows us to to reflect and to be critical of, of what's going on. Being profit-driven, their nature and content becomes determined by its financing, by its ability to appropriately accompany the corporate world. Video, television, um, that's a different medium. A medium that says, here, take this. You need it. And my immediate reaction is, I am not in control with the television. I am not in control with the video. Things are being brought to me which I cannot control. The only way that I can control that is by turning off the switch. Because if I do not turn off the switch, then I will be bombarded with messages. Now, I'm more critical, more suspicious, especially of advertisement above all things. Because advertising in television wants to say, wants to create needs, which to me is always an odd thing, a created need. The arts become viewed as fuel for fashion, 
Market-driven media demands excitement and newness, not reevaluation and reflection. New information simply shoves old questions aside, however unresolved, whereas reading encourages the slow integration of ideas. Non-print media are like fireworks, instantly registered with little time to explore consequences. I think there's the, the, the power of a, me, um, a film or TV media too to shape your perceptions because you're being manipulated when you're seeing that and you're being told in effect by the handling of these elements what to think, what to feel. And so in some sense, I feel uh, that can be an invasion of my privacy. And uh, when I walk into a, a home, for instance, that's always got the TV going, I mean, I, mean, I want to shut that off. That's, that's, that's invading me. I, I don't want to be dragged into that. Or if a radio is always on, again, it feels to me like often an invasion of my privacy. So I think the contrast of the private and the public is very strong here in these different media. And it certainly affects how we think of ourselves if we are a communal person, if we identify ourselves communally, or if we're uh, a unique individual and we identify ourselves as somehow different from others. Non-print media favors breadth, favors the topical, the new. It floats us over the dread of depth. We are now in the midst of a technological literacy as we consciously and eagerly shrink the globe, transmitting and absorbing information thereby blurring cultural borders in the attempt to discover a common ground. Well, when I first started to delve into the electronic media, um, it was over a modem to bulletin boards. And the thrill of being in my studio and yet reaching out visually and with text into the ether was very mysterious for me and exciting. As a kid, I would make a big string loop that would go from my back porch to across to another playmate across the alley and we would send messages back and forth across the string. Uh, later, when I learned about electronics, I would hook up intercom sets using old vacuum tubes that would communicate from house to house. So I've always wanted to do this kind of reaching out to something around me. Well, as a teacher, I'm concerned by what I see of the misuses of technology. I think that um, the push for distance learning disturbs me. Uh, the idea that we may not know education as we know it today in about 20 years, there won't be classes, there won't be interaction between people, um, is to me um, bother, troublesome. And um, I think that the new technologies have given us a lot. They've opened up the world for each of us, but they've also separated us. In some ways, we're being brought together, but at the same time, we're being pulled apart. And I'm disturbed by that. Traditional rituals are a communal network. These rituals are prompted by the unknown, by risk, scarcity, and mystery. But in a secure middle-class society with unlimited technological provisions, rituals decline. The spiritual vacuum that is left is replaced by a relentless abundance of entertainment, essentially a distraction from those issues addressed by ritual, love, marriage, justice, worship, and death. This diversion, created from our misuse of media, has dulled our perception of fundamental concerns. TV programs and films, which exhibit affluent lifestyles and environments containing surplus food, cars, and leisure time, convey a misleading visual message to the poor that overwhelms the spoken plot. When we are overwhelmed by information, we distill the contradictions and mysteries into myths. Myths vividly communicate when transformed by the arts. Traditional democracy has been driven by informed debate, 
between options that are grounded in research and wisdom. But market-driven, media poll determined policies pose a new and unique threat. The televising of war results in shorter wars or wars less tolerated, as in Vietnam. In America's involvement in the Middle East, we have a military strategy shaped by sponsors, some of whom are oil companies with obvious vested interests in the presentation and outcome of the war. Seeing is believing, but in the 20th century of science, technology, psychology, and theology, a more accurate phrase would be seeing is doubting. Intelligence is not what you know, it is how you behave or think when you don't know. Intelligence is the independent, creative, and critical response to an unknown circumstance. We have come to realize that invisible realities propel life more than those available to our senses. The arts are the cultural communication network that transcends time, place, and social organizations. Historically, the arts have challenged participants to momentarily abandon oneself in order to enter another sensibility. In so doing, through emotion and originality of image, we may generate genuine understanding. The understanding that places us in context to our world, reconnecting humanity. Every day, we cast our perceptual nets, inevitably snagging something for our consciousness to process. We exist in relationship. The meaning of our life is reflected in those relationships. Um, I learn a lot of the computer from my brother because um, he he knows more about it than I do. And do you think your brother will learn from you? Johnny? Johnny? Yeah. Really? Yeah, I like to use the computer. When I read a book, I think it's pretty neat because it kind of takes you to another place. And you, if you have a really good imagination. You can actually feel you being in that place and you can be in the position of the character in the book. Um, my brother... <laughs> my brother taught me to play on the computer and get into it, into the games. Well, I don't think in movies you really feel like you're there. Because, I, I mean, you can see the heads around you and you can see the sides of the screen. And, uh, and like, it's not really as imaginative as reading. Do you ever print any writing on the computer? Oh, yeah, yeah. Can you tell us what, how you do that? Well, you go to the thing that it says print and, and then it shows, it says, like you can like you like press five and it prints five of those things so yeah it and then you press print again and it prints it that's right 